maximize or make the image more dark, right? And so the saliency um, uh, procedure is that we just backpropagate that for the information back. And it gives us some sense of which pixels, if we perturb, will affect the actual output of or whether it's a dog or not. So you can see, like, here if we take a gradient with respect to the class 4 and the pixel values, we get, we figure out that, like, the, the pixels that correspond to, like, the actual dog are the ones that, like, maintain, like, the highest value after we do our back propagation updates. And so here's some more salience maps, like there's a shift, and you can see like the pixels that matter most are like the tip of the cell, and then there's like that middle fruit thing, and like the middle pixels are important to understanding that the fruit thing. Um, so another thing that we can do with Salency because we're capturing pretty much the main pixels that matter. Um, is we can combine it with graph cut. Um, I think it, it's some like graph cutting algorithm. But essentially, if we use a salency map and graph cut, we could um, entirely segment out like the image of interest, which is kind of interesting if you think about like these these cutouts aren't like that good compared to like what you can do, but like the neural, the neural net has no idea that there's a goose inside the image. It's just pixel data. But still, with these techniques, it can figure out where exactly the goose is in, in the actual image, which is pretty interesting. Um, OK. So with, so if you remember back, or a few slides ago, I talked about the receptive field of the neuron and figuring out the patches that maximize the activation of the, um, of the neuron. However, like the patches that we outputted weren't, they weren't descriptive enough for us. Like we can see that it's looking for like circular objects, but like where exactly in the patch is, is important. And that's where guided backpropagation comes in. And what it does is it kind of produces clear images which tell us exactly what, what part of the patch is interesting to the, to the um, neuron. So how we do, um, so doing guided backpropagation is actually really simple. All we do is when we're backpropagating to our neural activation functions, we only keep the positive values. And so what this is doing is instead of keeping track of the entire gradient information, we're sort of just keeping track of the positive influences. So here's the example. So like, here's the original like um, patch that was simulating the neuron, and then on the right side, like in the top row, we have the circle. We actually see like the distinctive circle. It's actually showing us where the patch is actually activating the neuron properly. And so this is again gives us a better interpretation of what our models are actually doing. Um, here's some more examples of, of guided back propagation. But does anyone kind of see like an issue with doing techniques like this um, in terms of understanding a network? No? Okay. Well, the problem here is that we want to we want to be able to generally understand what the network is doing, but in these cases, we're holding like a fixed image value to kind of under get some interpret interpretation of what the network is doing. So, what? How do we actually understand the general case? And that's where gradient ascent comes in. So, again, we're not retraining the model or doing any sort of updates to the actual weights. We're trying to understand what the network is doing. So we're fixing the actual weights of the network. So we can use some pre-trained model. And we perform, so again, we're taking the gradient with respect to the uh, class 4 and the pixel values. And what we do is instead of walking down that gradient, we walk up the gradient. 
And what this does is, like going back to the dog example, we're trying to make the image more dog-like. And so instead of optimizing weights, we're now just trying to adjust the image pixel values to maximize the, the neural value. And if you see here, there is um, a regularization term. It's kind of confusing, but essentially all it's doing is it's preventing the network from sort of overfitting to like the peculiarities of a specific image. So then you kind of get this general consensus of what it's actually doing or what it's looking at. So the process here is that. Can you go back one slide? Shouldn't it be minus the regularization term? Because if you go forward one slide, it's minus. Because you're maximizing. Because in this case, you'd be maximizing the regular, regularizer too. Um, so we go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think that, that should be a minus sign. Um, but uh, some of that can just be captured. I guess I can help it. Um, but yes, yeah, it should be a minus sign because you're walking up and you want to analyze the, the model. But so the procedure here is we start with a zero image, so just a complete like blank image. And then we forward that image to the network, we compute the scores, and then we take the gradient with respect to the specific class that we're looking at, um, with respect to the image pixels. And we forward that gradient information back and we adjust the pixels in our zero image to um, reflect the class that we're looking at. And yeah, so a little bit more about the regularizer term is like here they're using L2 regularization. Um, I don't think it's like semantically meaningful. Like there's not really any good reason other that it works well. And it forces the images to actually look more normal because it's not overfitting to specific examples. But so here's like the output. So we started with a blank image. We so I guess in the first case, so the demo. We start with a blank image. We want to figure out what um, what the network sees is like a dumbbell, essentially. So we choose, we fix the class, and then we update the image or update our input image based on the grade information of the dumbbell class, and we get like this sort of dumbbell-like image. So like you can see, there's kind of like these like like curvy parts of like the weights. Um, the bottom ones I think is a bit clearer. It's like so it's the bell peppers. You see, there's like a bunch of different bell peppers kind of there's like five bell peppers in it. Um, one thing's kind of straightforward. There's like Dalmatian, which you can kind of see like the face of the Dalmatian, but it's kind of kind of weird. Um, again, here's some more examples. So like keyboard and boxes. Uh, okay, and so we talked about this like L2 formal uh, regularization, but there are some um, other techniques that can also clear up the image um, to ensure the, it's not worth any specific um, images. So like we can do um, Gaussian blur, we can clip the, the pixel values or clip the gradient. and these techniques that you do periodically will also clear up the image and make it clear, um, make it more clear what the network is doing. So here's some examples. So like the flamingo case, like that one I think is like easy to tell that it's like why the network thinks that's that's a flamingo. And then ground beetle is kind of like a beetle in these images. Um, some more examples. And again, we we can also do this creating a set technique, ask specific players. And so here we're just visualizing, we're doing gradient ascent from specific players. So you can see like at a like at a specific player what the network is actually looking for. So again, this is all for interpreting what the network is doing. And this one is kind of cool because like you have this kind of broad classes like grocery store, 
and you kind of get like this mix of different grocery items that, that the network is looking for. And here's some more examples of like different techniques that kind of like clear up the image, but I think this one is probably the best. Um, all, uh, so they optimize FCC, FCC link space, I'm not that familiar with that stuff though. But anyways, if you look at the actual images, they look pretty clear on what the network would be for, a lot better than the, the previous ones. So, sorry, are these the images that are like created? Yeah, oh. yeah. This is like the prototypical cheeseburger. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's, like it, it's kind of odd. Like here, like the full table is kind of like broken in half. The cell phone is like kind of cartoonish, and like you know, it's it's kind of weird thinking like this is how the network identifies like this class. Like, the this broken is, full table. Or full table. <laughs> so this is like the neural network like doodling in this case. I guess kind of. Uh, okay, so now I, I think so that was kind of like pretty much focused on just being able to interpret what the network is doing. So now we're going to kind of look at a really cool topic called um, adversarial um, examples. Or just There's a whole subtopic of deep learning that's dedicated to understanding these adversarial effects. So essentially the process is, again, you start with some arbitrary image, like that zeroed out image. You pick a class, and you try and, um, again, maximize the image to look more like that class, and then you repeat until the next page. So I guess the example is probably better to show. But here, we start with an elephant, right? And we choose the class fallout arbitrarily, and we keep making updates to the elephant image until the network thinks it's a fallout. And you know, like obviously to us, they're both elephants, but the network, these subtle changes, which you can see on like the very right hand side, um, tricks it into thinking that's quality. Which it's like you like you can think of like bad examples, like just like self-driving wise, like you like let's say someone comes up with there's some adversarial example out there that makes the network think a person's a soft finder, person's like Something, you know? Like, we don't want these things. But at the same time, it's actually really cool because, like, again, the network has no idea that it's an elephant. It's just looking at pixel data. So, like, these slight perturbations in pixel data make it think it's something completely else. There's no idea that there's an actual elephant in the image. But one comment about this is that it's not like we're just injecting random noise into the images. These are very like specific changes that we're making to the image to actually trick the network. And you can learn more about um, adversarial networks and being good fellows on here, which is in the slide. This, is there like a way to like do this for like human neural networks so you can like trick people and not just like a human neural network? Like if we could find someone's way to oh. use gradient scent and, and pull someone to think like, like I think they already kind of do that, right? Like there's different, like, um, probably like give someone drugs or something, and like their visual system gets all messed up, and you do all sorts of things that make them uh, show them like a picture of something, and then they think it's something else. No, I think there's probably already something like that. Uh, and then, so now we'll, okay, so this is not, this is kind of just for fun. This one is called Leap Dream. It was trained on the um, ImageNet data set. And the, the training procedure for Deep Dream is pretty simple. You just forward your um, images through your network. You choose like an arbitrary layer. And you set the gradient information to the activation of, of that neuron. You're not. And then you backstop the map through your network. And then you update, you make making small updates to the image. And so essentially what it's doing is it's amplifying the existing features that's already in the network at a specific layer. So like the network is kind of 
like you're figuring out what's stimulating that neuron, and you're capturing that, and then you're just randomly throwing it back onto the image. And I guess this sort of just passing the activation function back is a gradient is similar to maximizing the L2 norm of the features in that image. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the map, but the slides say. Okay, but here's the dream in action, right? So we start with this cloud image. And you do the dream training process, and we end up with this. So there's like a lot of weird things in this image, but this is what the network is seeing at these different patches in the image. And so here, like, you know, there is like these things. So like Admiral Dog, I guess, is like this famous one that kept showing up repeatedly in the network. Um, Pixnail, uh, Camelbird, Dogfish, like, you know, these things, like, it's not like we fed the network images of Admiral Dog, but like, this is kind of what the network is seeing through this sort of things. Um, but what's interesting here is like, you now you see like two dog, two dog examples, where you see like a lot of dogs in the picture. And this is actually, this is actually kind of helpful because it gives us some intuition about how the network is trained or what data the network is trained on. So the image net data set, I think, I can't remember how many classes it has, but a large portion of the classes are actually dogs. So you'd expect to see a lot of dogs in the, in the network. So, like, these are kind of like defined, like, right, you see, like, Admiral Dollar, like, these are sort of higher abstraction representations of what's happening in the image. This one is kind of a lower level one, so you can see, like, you never get this layer, is kind of seeing, like, textures and, like, edges and these, these lower level things. Um, okay, so this is another sort of deep dream-esque image. But the difference here is that instead of just passing, doing like one pass through deep green, they did like a multiple like scale process. So like they put it through deep green once, and then they um, ran another iteration where they passed it through again. And so you kind of get like these more complicated sort of images. Uh, here's another example. This one was using I think it was called like the places data set from. MIT, and we did this same thing with with um, well, the different data set. And you get like, you can kind of see like these are like based on places. Um, and you, but you get these like kind of really crazy designs. Um, okay. So, along these same lines, or lines of like at, or reconstructing from what's already like information that's already in the network is this idea of feature inversion. And so essentially what we're doing is we pass an image to the network, we collect its feature vector, and we try to so we, we, we pass a like an arbitrary image through. And then we collect its feature vector and we try to we try to perturb it so it looks more like a feature vector that we've already um, collected from like one of the classes that we've used. So then, it, again, it gives us some sense of what the network is looking for. Um, and then, so here we're kind of, um, the way that we're matching, I guess, the arbitrary uh, vector up to like our specific feature vector is we're just looking at the L2 norm difference. Um, and then there's this regularization term here it's called a total variation regularizer. And you can see that it's kind of penalizing adjacent pixels. And what this does is it encourages like smoothness across the image, because like if the adjacent ones match up and they're not too far apart, then you don't get these abrupt shifts and shift um, shifts in the image. <coughs> so we start with like we start with like essentially like Noise, and then we try to reconstruct um, the the feature information from like a specific layer, and you can see like um, as like the second layer, the 
the feature information is still like pretty much intact, right? But then as you propagate through the model and you get deeper and deeper and deeper, you get sort of these more abstract representations like um, the towards the end you can't even like um, really like you might not know that's actually the end of the So like you can see that like towards the later layers of the network, it's sort of abstracting information away so it can form these like higher level um, abstractions. Okay, so that kind of covers like the like a lot of the interpretation stuff and so now we'll start looking at style transfer. So this is actually um, a problem from computer graphics. And here it's like you're, you have some input texture that you want and you kind of want to just tile that across and create some sort of new image that has like the same um, texture. And this technique actually works very well from the graphics like you will just copy and throw. And here are like some examples like the red bricks, like you can easily pile those red bricks and then like there's some writing um, that you can easily pile. But here though, um, like these, these sort of textures are like pretty simple, right? Like if we want to do a more complicated texture, then these computer graphics techniques may not work as well. So that's where we start using our convolutional neural So the idea here is we can compute this thing called the gram matrix, which similar to like the like a covariance matrix, it's kind of capturing like statistics of like how two features kind of like vary together and whether they vary like based on um, spatially. But so we start with some texture. And here we have like some pebble texture. And we pass that through our CNN. And then we choose some layer, like arbitrarily, and we pull out the convolutional features of that layer. And so um, each layer is like outputting this convolutional volume, like this three-dimensional tensor. And then what we do is um, we extract like individual vectors from this this volume. And so what it's doing is so essentially, like with this volume is kind of capturing, if we choose a single vector on it, like because it's like c a c-dimensional vector, like at like some point of like h and w, this kind of tells us that h and w is kind of like a spatial grid, and the actual vector in dimension c is describing how that point should appear based on like this file. So what we do is we take those images, I mean take those, we choose two vectors, um, and we take the uh, outer product between them, so we get this C by C matrix. And the way that we compute the ground matrix is we choose, we do like all, we do like n choose two, we get all, all the combinations, and then we just average all the ground matrices down, so we have this average of the ground matrices. And so what it tells us, Again, is it's capturing like the spatial correlation or like um, between these vectors, so it's like telling us uh, which which features, I guess, tend to activate together. So, like here, like you might, um, uh, yeah. So again, it's just capturing like the spatial statistics. You can actually substitute the grab matrix with. A covariance matrix can still obtain like similar results. The, the problem is, is that the covariance matrix is a bit more computationally intensive, so that's generally why it's not used. It's more efficient to be able to calculate this grand matrix. And so how do we actually use it in practice is we train a network. So essentially, or we have some pre-trained network 
and then we pass our uh, style through, through the network. And then at each layer, we're computing these grammar matrices, right? These grammar matrices, again, are just telling us, like, giving us information about how that how we can transfer that style. So then what we do is we have our second um, network, pretty much, and we have or we feed through this arbitrary arbitrary noi noisy image, right? Just blank. And what we do is we compute the grammar matrix at each layer for that noisy image. And then we try, we construct a loss function based on the difference of these grammar matrices. So then what we're trying to do is we're essentially trying to match up the grammar matrices between these two images. And so we have our loss function. We calculate the gradient based on the difference of these two. Um, grab matrices and we propagate that gradient information back and that gives and that and then we update the pixels of the of the image. And so once we do that, we start with the noise image and we end up with like some pebble like image that also looks similar to the original one. And again if we were trying to do like the same technique with like computer graphics techniques, it might not pan through as well as using these networks. So here's some more examples of like style transfer. And you can see like the like for as you get deeper and deeper in the network, again you get these more sort of abstract um, textures kind of uh, coming out. Like so at the beginning, at the very top right, you start with like this gallery image. And then as you go through to the very bottom, you get like this thing that you can't really interpret as a gallery, but that's kind of what the network thinks is the texture of that image. Um, okay, so like I said, we won't be able to do this with more um, complicated textures. So maybe the te uh, texture of like art pieces. So here we can see like the, the style transfer of like starting night into like these these other noisy images. And these images are kind of, I guess, again, capturing like the style of that specific image. But so we talked about um, grammar reconstruction, which um, copies the style. And then we also talked about the um, the feature reconstruction that we talked about a few slides ago. So we can we can plot, so how we do style transfers, we actually combine those two approaches. So we have some sort of input image. So we have some content. So we have so this is what we want to reconstruct from, from uh, the network. So we start with some noise image. We want to reconstruct some weird like little town, but we also want to apply this style. So what we do is we combine sort of the ideas of feature reconstruction, and then we apply sort of this style um, style transfer. Um, type. So what the content is doing is it's saying what do we want to see, and the style is saying how do we want our image to look. And that's what you get at the end is you get this kind of town with the starry night applied to it. So what you're doing is you're generating a new image um, by minimizing the reconstruction loss of like the content image, because that's what you're trying to reproduce. And then you minimize the difference between the grammar matrices when you're applying the file. So you have these two sort of object objective functions that you're trying to minimize. Um, okay, so here's how it looks like architecturally. Uh, you have your input image that starts with noise that you're going to periodically adjust. You have the style image, which is style uh, target, and then you have your content image. And then you feed these three um, images to the network, and you're computing the, the Yeah, you're computing the gram matrix difference again, and then uh, 
doing the reconstruction loss, and this is like the great information that gets back propagated back, and this tells you how to update or adjust the pixels of the noisy image. And at the very end, you end up with like this town image with the uh, starry night. And so here's a few steps of what like the update process looks like. So you have noise, more noise, and then eventually you start actually seeing the, the actual style of the image being transferred onto this image. And so here's some more examples. Um, this is actually from your homework. So you have these different different styles that you can transfer on to this town image. So you have starry nine, and then you have like these other four. And so we have these, so again with style transfer, we have like these hyperparameters that we can choose that, um, that sort of affect how much style I guess is like, like inputted into the, or injected into the image. So if we add more weight to like the style, uh, the style loss, right? That means we want to capture more of the style in the image, and so you can see it's like more abstract, tries to essentially just become the style itself. And then if we give more weight to the content loss, then we actually care about the actual thing we're trying to produce. So, like in the case of this, we have like a face that we're trying to reproduce. And so the face is like much more clear. And so this is kind of just playing around with um, the size of the style and I guess how it affects like the actual final output. Because it's just a hyperparameter that you can mess around with. Um, but this one is multiple styles. So, like, you know, the way that we talk about style transfers is actually a very computationally intensive task, right? Because you're creating scram matrices, you're doing this feature reconstruction, and you're passing back all this great information. So, if you wanted to try multiple styles, that single approach is actually. Um, quite expensive and it would take a pretty long time to actually train that network to be able to do multiple styles. And that's what this slide is saying. Like, if you want to do multiple styles, then you need to do all these forward passes and backward passes, always propagating the screen information back. And so again, like a lot of the themes in this course is like, okay, maybe we can just train another network to actually do this task for us, so we don't have to do all these um, intensive steps. So the idea here is that we just train a single network to out, uh, to produce a style, like a single style. So the the starting next style. And that way, when we forward an input image to that that new network, it essentially just gets the the style applied to it. But this this way. We're actually using deep learning to do this task. And so the computation time is um, a lot faster, um, but the, the style, I, I would say, isn't as robust as the previous one because the neural network is kind of learning some um, approximation for some approximation functions for actually producing that style. And so here's more examples. So this one in the on the right side is actually like the neural net implement, uh, implementation of the neural net style one. And it actually runs in real time. So like if you have a camera, you can play around with it and you can move your hand and it'll automatically apply the style. And there's been some more work, I guess, in speeding up this this sort of uh, style transfer, and they use like, parallelization, and they achieve, I guess, similar results to um, in the, the previous works. And 
So there's another, so we talked about batch normalization. There's also this other thing called instant normalization, which is another normalization technique. But if we replace um, our batch normalization with instant normalization, we actually get clearer results. I'm not sure if there's any like specific reason behind that, other than it just works well in practice. And a recent, oh, well, I guess it's not recent, but from 2017, Google trained this network to be able to um, do uh, transfer multiple signals. So you sort of get this option of being able to choose what value you want to be able to apply to your images. And this kind of leads to the idea of blended styles. So you can choose multiple styles to be applied to um, a single image. So that's pretty much the, the material. But just a quick summary. We spent most of the lecture talking about how to understand the, um, the what's going on inside the CNN. And this is actually really important because we want to be able to, if we deploy these in the real setting, we want, we want to be able to know how to behave. Um, and these techniques, we talked about looking at like activation functions, um, capturing the nearest neighbors, and then plotting those, or capturing the embedding vectors, and then plotting those nearest neighbors. We also talked about dimensional reduction of the embedding vectors, looking at the um, the patches that maximize the activation function of the neuron, and then also occlusion, building those heat maps. Um, so we also have some gradient techniques where we're doing like balancing maps um, and adversarial examples and the uh, feature inversion or feature reconstruction. And then for fun, we have Deep Dream and Style Sensors. Uh, that's pretty much the material. So any questions? OK, well, I guess we can end early. Uh, we'll be here for like a few minutes to answer questions. Um, Uh, 
I think yeah, it's, it's also. Right so do, we, do we decide? No, we have to decide. Uh, it's more about to It's more about to think about it. It kind of matches the Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I just have a bunch of questions. So, when uh, you're like using the gradient descent to add what you like blank image or your blank image. Yeah, there's two terms. It's hard. I mean, what uh, is a function you're taking? Yeah. Like, so, so, what's that? Uh, so, uh, is that the uh, R uh, max? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what I did, I did one more step, I normalized it. Okay. And then you would pass the noise to, okay. you get the gradient of that with pixel values, and yeah. then you would agree with the if you're trying right. to make it look more like a dog. So you can do it as a sweet piece of work. So like, you can start doing something that, like, this should be a dog. And so I'm just looking at that output. Yeah. And then you would just like, normalize the noise image to the gradient of 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 the gradient Unless you did an adversarial. Right. Um, so and are you, so, so then, because you're kind of like setting a, uh, a node. So each of your steps is either. Yeah. You don't have to go accept the node steps. Are you, like, you know right. that your model that you're sending is correctly classified? Because according to this, this equation, regularly, step sign, well, so only you applies on. You use like a pre-trained model. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like yeah. pretty much a given that it should be able to do it. Call, the example of um, the green up image that you find that probably in time to render it already by okay. in the software. And then we did that. Yeah, you're kind of like working with that. Okay. Yeah. Kind of correctly identified. Yeah. Because we're trying to understand it now. So like, we're not really trying to correct, but that's how it's going to this torrent flow is up again. It's hard to tell visually, but it looks Different from mm -hmm. legs. And it is different from the legs. I won't show the end, but I'll tell you. Um, uh, so, they're asking about the visualization part. Is so, does it look like the answer? Yeah, I think so. It looks like spiders. <laughs> <laughs> but compare with the. Uh, have you. Yeah, I'm 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 have you taken a look at the, the answer picture? No. I, I think. But like. I mean, it's hard to check visually, but I feel. Yeah, I think like. Yeah, if you add the regularization term, then it's. Yeah, it's like crazy. Because based on this, based on this equation, the step size only applies on the gradient of your network. So R sub theta is a direction of regularizing. So that's how they define R sub theta. I might be wrong, but uh, yeah. Oh. So the steps are only trying. A sub Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're, you're still walking with the gradient, like, you need a step size, so like, what? Yeah, it's easy. So A sub, oh, A sub y of x is a score, right? It's a score given by Yeah, so you're taking the gradient with respect to the score to the, the uh, pixel data. Pixel data. And then that that's your loss, that's your kind of curve, and then you have some steps like that you want to have the curve. But well, I guess what's the question? But how about the gradient of regularized? Should the should the learning rate be multiplied to 
to the gradient red light. Because based on the based on the formula here, it only it's only multiplied by Wait, the gradient. No, no, no. So the learning rate isn't applied to the regularizer, but you do have some hyperparameter that you use to scale the regularizer. To lambda. Yeah. So the regular so the learning rate only applies on the gradient. Yeah, yeah. yeah the actual step. Okay, so so you might want to change your code. Uh, somehow you want to, because you, you call back what here, you get gradient of all things, including the regularizer, right? So it seems to be five regularizers inside the box. So, and you, you apply the learning rate times image of red, which, in, which includes the regularizer. You, you want somehow only apply okay. uh, I think it's really like, this is only the one loss issue with a regular. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay.